18 year old individual to have this Hawaiian mother just take me under her wings was the kindest and most thoughtful thing. So I, hi Elaine. Hello, good morning, how good are morning. you? I'm doing so great. I was just talking about my first day at BYU Hawaii and and this wonderful Hawaiian woman who just took me under her wing, even though I was so homesick and homeless. So I was talking about how I completely resonate, at least with, with Brother Esplin, and how kind and how important it is to to love and care for each other, how much I felt that when I was in Hawaii from the wonderful people that were there when I was a freshman, 18 year old at BYU Hawaii. I mean, it's just amazing what th these feelings of love that we feel for each other. And both of these talks, I believe, talk about that incredible love that we have for brothers and sisters under, especially as we are covenant keeping people with Jesus Christ. Uh, absolutely. I missed the first part of what you said because I keep struggling to get on. You know, I think there's a pause with Instagram that is a little tricky for me. But anyway, hello everybody, and it's it's a new day and a new week. And I think these two talks are two of the sweetest talks. They really this they are. Uh, this first one by Elder Esplin is it just made me cry. I, I he didn't ever give the name of the woman, but. What a legacy, what a, what a life. And it wasn't easy, but she, uh, you know, it's my, it's my, what I always say. I believe one virtuous woman led by the spirit can change the world. And I really think that this woman has changed generations. So this precious story. Yeah. I mean, Elaine, we just had the international women's day, which we haven't done a lot with, but I look at these talks and this woman talk about an international women's day memorial. I mean, you know, Elaine, we talked about before we, you know, before we just jumped on here, how how we are not just reviewing talks, but we're seriously looking at doctrines and principles and applications and things, which we'll talk about. But I wonder, I, I recognize that this this is a, a shorter talk by one of the members of the 70. Would it be appropriate if we just read through this talk, this part of this talk, just to remind people of this amazing Japanese woman and her story? What do you think, oh, Elaine? Oh, I think it would. And, and maybe as as Barb reads this, uh, you can be saying to yourself, well, so what doctrine is he trying to teach? What's the why? Why is he, why is he telling us this illustrative story? And then maybe we can have everybody just put the doc, what doctrine they think it is. Cause it, it could be a lot of whys, but just, you know, our, our, our doctrine of the Godhead, uh, the plan of salvation, the atonement, and the restoration perhaps just those four just think of those and let's let's just see what we come up with and maybe elaine as we're doing that doing those doctrines but also maybe we can look at the principles and have yeah. a discussion about the principles as well just to keep us grounded sometimes it's so fun to get into these stories but we have that reminder from elder bednar elder elder scott and many others to look through the stories and try to find the doctrine and principles that are embedded within them so here we go i'm going to start okay so those of you on here, we would love to see your thoughts on the doctrine and principles. And even if you want to explain it, this is a doctrine because, and just take a second to type that in. Okay, here we go. So he says, he's talking about, about these members in, in the Laie Hawaii temple area. And he says, we lived near the Hawaii temple when it served much of the church membership of the Asia Pacific area, including Japan. At this time, groups of Japanese saints began coming to Hawaii to receive the blessings of the temple. Now here he goes, and this is paragraph number two for those who have it. One of these members was a sister from the beautiful island of Okinawa. The story of her journey to the Hawaii temple is remarkable. Two decades earlier, she had been married in a traditional arranged Buddhist wedding. Just a few months later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, thrusting the United States into a conflict with Japan. In the wake of battles such as Midway and Iwo Jima, the tides of war pushed the Japanese forces back to the shores of her island home, Okinawa, the last line of defense standing against the Allied forces before the heartlands of Japan. For a harrowing three months in 1945, the Battle of Okinawa raged. A flotilla, a flotilla of 1,300 American warships encircled and bombarded the island. Military and civilian casualties were enormous. I don't know those numbers, but he says here, Today, a solemn monument in Okinawa lists more than 240,000 known mm -hmm. names of people who perished in battle. I, I cannot fathom that number of people who died in Okinawa. In a desperate attempt to escape the onslaught, this Okinawan woman, 
her husband and their small children sought refuge in a mountain cave. They endured unspeakable misery through the ensuing weeks and months. One desperate night, amidst the battle with her family, near starvation and her husband unconscious, she contemplated ending their suffering with a hand grenade, with which authorities had supplied to her for others for that purpose. I, mean, I, can't, I, I also can't imagine for a mother to get to the point where she's actually contemplating that, but also to have the government give her the hand grenades and what that actually meant. I, it, this, this story is unimaginable to me. However, yeah. as she prepared to do so, a profoundly spiritual experience unfolded that gave her a tangible sense of the reality of God and his love for her, which gave her the strength to carry on. In the following days, she, she, revived, with her hus she revived her husband and fed her family with weeds, honey from a wild beehive, and creatures caught in a nearby stream. Remarkably, they endured six months in the cave until local villagers informed them that the battle had ended. When the family returned home and began rebuilding their lives, this Japanese woman started searching for answers about God. She gradually kindled the belief in Jesus Christ and the need to be baptized. However, she was concerned about her loved ones who had died without a knowledge of Jesus Christ and baptism, including her mother who had died giving birth to her. Imagine her joy when two sister missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints came to her house one day and taught her that people can learn about Jesus Christ in the spirit world. She was captivated by the teaching that her parents could choose to follow Jesus Christ after death and accept baptism performed on their behalf in holy places called temples. She and her family were converted to the Savior and baptized. Her family worked hard and began to prosper, adding three more children. They were faithful and active in the church. Then, unexpectedly, her husband suffered a stroke and died, compelling her to work long hours at multiple jobs for many years to provide for her five children. Some people in her family and her neighborhood criticized her. They blamed her troubles on her decision to join a Christian church. Undeterred by profound tragedy and harsh criticism, she held on to her faith in Jesus Christ, determined to press forward, trusting that God knew her and that brighter days were ahead. A few years following her husband's untimely death, the mission president of Japan felt inspired to encourage the Japanese members to work towards attending the temple. The mission president was an American veteran of the Battle of Okinawa. Again, this it's just, it's, it's, it's uncanny. Uh, we say that was a real coincidence, but I, the Lord, the Lord is so aware of us individually. So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I recognize I'm reading a long story, which we typically don't do, but this story is just so, so incredible in which the Okinawan sister and her family had suffered so much. Nonetheless, the humble sister said of him, he was then one of our hated, en hated enemies, but now he was here with the gospel of love and peace. This to me was a miracle. Upon hearing the mission president's message, the widow's sister desired to be sealed to her family in the temple someday. However, it was impossible for her due to financial constraints and language barriers. Then several innovative solutions emerged. The cost could be reduced by half of its members in Japan chartered an entire plane to fly to Hawaii in the off season. Members also recorded and sold vinyl records entitled Japanese Saints Sing. Some members even sold homes. Others quit their jobs to make the trip. The other challenge for members was the temple presentation was not available in Japanese. That's right. Church leaders called a Japanese brother to travel to the Hawaiian temple to translate the endowment ceremony. He was the first Japanese convert after the war, having been taught and baptized by faithful American soldiers. I'm going to keep inviting everyone to look for principles here because I'm trying to not say some that I'm finding. <laughs> when the endowed Japanese members lived in Hawaii first heard of the translation, they wept. One member recorded, we've been to the temple many, many times. We've heard the ceremonies in English, but we have never felt the spirit of temple work as we feel it now, hearing it in our own native tongue. Later that same year, 161 adults and children embarked from Tokyo to make their way to the Hawaii temple. One Japanese brother reflected on the journey. As I looked out of the airplane and saw Pearl Harbor and remembered what our country had done to these people in December of 7, 1941, I feared in my heart, will they accept us? But to my surprise, they showed greater love and kindness than I had ever seen in my life. Upon the Japanese saints arrival, the Hawaiian members welcomed with countless strands of fl flower lays while exchanging hugs and kisses on the cheeks and custom foreign to Japanese culture. After spending 10 
transformative days in Hawaii, the Japanese saints bid farewell to the melody of Aloha Oi, sung by the Hawaiian saints. The second temple trip organized for the Japanese members, including the widowed Okinawan sister. She made the 10,000 mile journey thanks to a generous gift from missionaries who had served in her branch and had eaten many meals at her table. While in the temple, she shed, she shed tears of joy as she acted as a proxy for her mother's baptism and was sealed to her deceased husband. Temple excursions from Japan, I'll just read these last two. Temple excursions from Japan to Hawaii continued regularly until the Tokyo Temple, Tokyo Japan Temple was dedicated in 1980, becoming the 18th temple in operation. In November of this year, the 186th temple will be dedicated in Okinawa, Japan. It is located not far from the cave in central Okinawa where this woman and her family sheltered. Though I never met this wonderful sister from Okinawa, her legacy lives on through her faithful posterity, many of whom I know and love. And then he goes on to tell about his father, and then he gives some more doctrines and principles. So perhaps just quickly, those, those listening and participating this early mo Monday morning with daylight savings, I am just, Elaine and I are, are, are asking you, what doctrines and principles, if you could type these in the comments, what doctrines and principles are you able to find in this very beautiful story of this woman from Okinawa, Japan? And then we can talk through and maybe we can read some of these as we go, but maybe let's just take a couple of seconds just to anything, any, any doctrines and principles that you find here. Well, can I just, can I just interrupt while we're taking the seconds and tell you that when, when he said that the temple was built not too far away from where that woman sheltered in a cave for six months, that's when I, I was on my walk with him and that's when I started crying <laughs> right here in the neighborhood because that, oh my goodness, what a story. What a story. So what is the doctrine, Barb? Have you got it all down to tell us? I was thinking maybe it's, maybe it's just the Godhead, you know, that he, that Heavenly Father knows us individually. We are his children and he, he walks with us. He, even through I mean, she had the most difficult life, uh, but even through all of those trials, she found Jesus Christ. She found God, and that that and she became they became an eternal family, and that makes everything worth it, doesn't it? It it, it absolutely does. And when I think of this, I, I noticed how many times, and I don't, I didn't count it up, but I just noticed even in reading it again, how many times the word love was being used. And what's interesting to me is she's not only loving her family, but she's loving this, this mission president who was, an, who was her enemy. And now she's able to love her. I think of these people who are saving the money so that they could send her to the temple and the love that they were feeling. I think of this love that she expresses for her, for, for, for her mother as she was performing that baptism. So I think for me, one of, the, one of the critical doctrines that I'm looking for is the atonement of Jesus Christ. And as we make and keep sacred covenants, as President Nelson has said so many times, that we are endowed with an even greater capacity to love. And, and part of this, she had not yet received her endowment, but I believe in that that love, that love, um, that that love, that that love really does supersede here. And as she continues, I just love this where he says, she says, "This humble sister said of him, it's." had she been prideful and had she been uh, willing to, to hold on to bitter feelings, this is a number 10, had she not been willing and able to forgive this, this man and all the people, she would never have been able to have this love and she would never have been able to accept this miracle of the Lord. But because she was humble, because she was willing to put her hands in the hands of the Lord, she was able to love this person who was once her enemy, as it says, he was then one of our hated enemies, but now he was here with the gospel of love and peace this to me was a miracle. And you can just feel this love and you can see how her desire to not be offended and her desire to forgive quickly, which I believe is, these are principles associated with the atonement of Jesus Christ. This is what made it possible for all of these people to be healed and be able to receive their temple uh, blessings and to be able to make covenants. It's because of the atonement of Jesus Christ that she was able to overcome these horrible feelings and be healed of this horrible, of this horrible hatred that, that the world causes so much within us and that anger and mal 
Alice and pride causes within us. I think you just nailed it, Barb. I really do. And I'm sitting here uh, while you're talking about the, do the atonement. Oh, for sure. I think that's the powerful doctrine. And um, I'm looking at, at comments that are teaching and saying the principles that were contained in this talk. And there are so many, aren't there? Oh, there's so I mean, so I've, many. I've just jotted down some of the ones that you, you've put up. Uh, you've taught us, sisters, forgiveness, observe and obey, faith, covenants, kindness, love. What else? Oh, it, 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 this is absolutely amazing. Elaine, I, I want to throw this out for the next part, starting in number 20, okay. where, he's, where he does say, well, it's 20, he talks about being called there and he arriving in, in, in Japan. But he says, I arrived in Japan shortly after the Tokyo temple was dedicated and saw firsthand their love for the temple. Again, there's that word love. And then 21, I just love what he's teaching us about the temple here as well. And then he quotes President Nelson. He says, temple covenants are gifts from our heavenly father to the faithful followers of his son, Jesus Christ. Through the temple, our heavenly father binds individuals and families to the savior and to, and to each other. So again, a principle of binding, when we make and keep sacred covenants with the Lord, he binds us. And then this, this quote by President Nelson, he says in number 23, and 24 each person who makes covenants and baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of jesus christ the reward for keeping covenants with god is heavenly power power that strengthens us to withstand our trials temptations heartaches better the power eases our way i i just think i think of this power and what she's able to receive and what these people are able to receive. And I think of that principle of when we make and keep sacred covenants with God, we really are endowed with his power. Yesterday, I was, I was teaching the young women about temple and about priesthood. I was just asked to come in and just kind of share some thoughts about priesthood and how young women can access God's priesthood power and also how we receive this power. And it was an interesting moment when many of the older women in that discussion talked about how sometimes we talk about mother's tuition, intuition, and sometimes we say that a mother has incredible intuition, and it is my belief very strongly that what we often call a mother's intuition is actually priesthood power. And, and sometimes we almost dismiss it using the terminology of the world, but I would strongly invite all of us that we look at the covenants that we have made and the promises that we have made and recognize as covenant-keeping women and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is not merely an intuition. This is lives are being saved, souls are being enriched, families are being dedicated to the Lord, children are being healed, marriages are coming back together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Patience, love, everything is being enhanced, not just because of a mother's intuition, because of God's priesthood power that women have in their lives. And the purpose of the priesthood is to save souls. So it's not just simply an intuition. This is God's power that women have. And it is part of who we are as women, as we keep covenants with God. I totally agree. And you, uh, it reminds me of the scripture in Doctrine and Covenants. You'll probably know the, the chapter and verse, but it says in the ordinance thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And I, uh, I believe that. And because we couldn't navigate all the things that we do in this world if we didn't have that kind of power with us and uh, I, oh, go, no, ahead. go ahead sorry no insert because you're you're on a roll today barb <laughs> <laughs> well i was just going to insert the reference because you're right and i think references are so important yeah. because it is one of my all-time favorites is section is doctrine and covenant section 84 verse 20 and so in 20 he, i just want to make this point it says and the greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom even the key of the knowledge of God, which both women and men have, that's President, that's President Benson speaking that very clearly. And then he says, therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. This, this, in the ordinances thereof, the power of God is manifest. Sorry, Elaine, I did interrupt no, you. So no, please go you ahead. know what? I'm glad that you found that because I, again, I'm studying section 84. If, if you want to understand what we already have as women, 
study it's the most empowering section uh, but pray before and ask the spirit to help you understand it really is just just amazing and sometimes i think we look beyond what we already have and think we don't have much but we are so blessed Elaine, I can't agree more. I mean, that's, this is what I was telling the young woman yesterday. When we talk about the eternities and we talk about what really matters, it's family and it's relationships with our, with, our, with our Father in Heaven, with heavenly parents. It's our relationship with each other. It's building and strengthening this relationship. And that is what God has created in temples. This is what matters. N not, not to minimize the importance of the church, but as Elder Ballard says, the church is a scaffolding to what the Lord has prepared for the eternities, which is the family. And in mortality, especially in this day with, with, with restoration, we absolutely need the church and we need the covenants associated with the church organizational structure to be able to make the covenants we make in the temple. But, but we have to recognize that in the eternities, it is father and mother. And that's why when, you know, when we go to the temple, we're sealed for eternity. We are starting our own kingdom. A father and a mother start their own kingdom. My nephew and niece just got married this weekend, and it was the most beautiful reminder of this couple right there, as young as they are, both of them straight off their missions. These guys, they are starting a, they are starting a family, and it's a kingdom, and they are going to be blessed with, with this posterity. You know, another thing that I thought was interesting that the sealer mentioned to us in that is when we sustain and say that we sustain the, the Lord's anointed, which I think this is fascinating, he said, remember that we're talking about the Lord's anointing. We're not just talking, uh, Lord's anointed. We're not just talking about prophets and apostles and leaders. Every person who has gone to the temple has been anointed. And so when we're talking about sustaining and not speaking evil against the Lord's anointed, we're talking about each other. We're talking about our families. We're talking about our spouse. We're talking about our brothers and sisters. And that was a good reminder that when we're making and keeping sacred covenants, just as like is talking about with this woman here, we, we, say that we are going to speak positively about each other and, and and lift that and build that and so i speak kindly of elaine i also speak kindly and uphold my husband and my children anyway i i thought that was a great reminder to me today especially as we're talking about learning to forgive and the atonement of jesus christ and how important that is oh Barbara, the Lord's Barbara, you, you've you've just taught us a wonderful thing i was i was in the temple on saturday uh doing just the initiatory work for a bunch of ancestors. And it, oh, what a powerful experience as you bring up what you just taught us. So thank you so much. Getting back to this talk, I'd say that in paragraph 25, it says kind of what you were teaching, but you yeah. magnified it. Through temple blessings, the Savior heals individuals, families, and nations. Oh, remember that. Even those that once stood as bitter enemies. The resurrected. Lord declared to a conflict-ridden society in the Book of Mormon that unto those who honor my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And I so believe that. I think there's even a talk maybe by, uh, oh, uh, it's by Elder Karen, I yeah. think, with healing in that's his right. wings. And that's an, oh, read, read that talk, everyone. That's a magnificent talk. Elaine, on that, on that same note, and I appreciate that reminder, when we're talking about that women and, and priesthood and mother's intuition and things, women's intuition, it, it, it's, it's, it's not the women's power, it's the Savior's power. That, I mean, I think that's what's so beautiful, is when we are covenanted with the Lord, He is the one who is saving individuals and families and nations. And he, it is His name that we're taking upon us, and therefore, we are able to act in His name, calling upon His name, being His servant. I, I love here, Elaine, you're talking about this idea of, of the power of godliness, the scripture that you mentioned. Elder Ballard, I mean, Elder Bednar talks about how when we're talking about the power of godliness, it is the power to become like him. It's, it's the power that we have <laughs> as we become more and more like God, we become powerful instruments in his hands and we become powerful, but it's God's power. We become God's pow powerful instruments and that power increases within us just like it did with Jesus Christ in section 93. Until, as it says in 93, he says, until you also have gained all power, a fullness of the power of God, which is available to only to those who make and keep sacred temple covenants. It is, and I, I think that's why it's so important that, that, uh, that we're looking as 
women at the doctrine, the principles, and then the application or practices. Because when we start studying scriptures in the, in that way, and we see and we are studying talks, and I'm thrilled because all the comments you you got it. All these women, they've got it, and it's just wonderful. It's a life changer. And then we just buckle down and say, what am I doing to disqualify myself for this power? How can I, how can I access that more? How can I be what our Heavenly Father has allowed us and given us to be? And how can I bless others' lives? So this is, even though it seems like a simple little talk, and, and, but with a beautiful story, this is profound, profound doctrine on the atonement, as Barbara has just said. And I, I love this man. I don't, I don't know him. I used to know all the general authorities because when they were newly called, they'd come to the young women office and meet with us for two or three days. Wow. And we would train them in, in the uh, auxiliary of the young women so they would understand uh, what we were trying to accomplish so that they could help us accomplish that. But I didn't get that privilege with Elder Esplin. I just, I, I want to go back because after we read, we'll read this next talk, but at the very first of his talk, he tells us why he was named Chemo. Oh, yeah. And, and that's a beautiful, as you said, Barbara, Hawaiian name. It's a, it's a, a name for a boy. And it's akin to naming a child John. I looked oh, this I up. I didn't know that, Elaine. This is great. Or James. Wow. And, and it, it means supplanter, which is uh, uh, likened to the birthright of Jacob wow. and Esau. Oh. And so this is a wonderful man, beautiful talk. And I just, I'm so grateful for the sweetness of this story. But it's true. And for this woman who kept the faith and who, I wonder what that spiritual experience was that she had before when she was contemplating. I know, and he doesn't go into detail here, but we know it must have been enough for her to seek after truth. And what's fascinating to me is she has this, this experience in that cave, and then it's such a spiritual experience that it saves her life, the life of her children, the life of her husband. It gives her that kind of power. And then when she finds the church that represents that power, she joins it immediately. That, that to me says something about that power and the recognition of what I felt in this tunnel, this cave. When the missionaries taught it to me and I recognized it, this is what saved my life in the cave. And this is the church I need to join. That to me, that's pretty powerful. El Elaine, in this number 27, maybe we finish off with this talk. If anything else you want to share, we, could, we have the next talk to go to. But she, he says this, I testify at this. Savior Jesus Christ and of his prophet and apostles in these latter days. And then to me, this is another principle that he's sharing that kind of ties up this whole talk. I solemnly bear witness of the heavenly power to bind in heaven what is bound on earth. This is the Savior's work and temples are his holy house. To me, again, it's just, it's this principle of when we make and keep sacred covenants with the Lord, because of his atonement, we are bound to him and therefore we are bound to each other. It's, it's just a powerful, powerful talk. Even in the most desperate of circumstances, when a lady is literally about to take her own life, the life of her husband and her children, and has lost everyone that she knows around her, what keeps her from doing that is the Savior, his atonement, and her, and her future, I believe, covenants that she is going to make. Just a, an incredible talk. If I could remember that, Elaine, if all of us could remember the beauty and the power that comes through our through our covenants, I, I think we could get through the difficult times when it when it's being single, being divorced, financial issues, LGBTQ, uh, any any type of abuse, any type of loneliness that we're feeling, any type of those any you I mean we could list and list and list and list the struggles of mortality because as many people as there are, there are that many struggles. But the beauty of that is, is the Savior can fix and heal all of them if we are bound to him, if we allow ourselves to be healed. I just think that's a beautiful concept here. Oh, uh, amen, Barbara. And just the, la I mean, the fact that they lived in a cave for six months, I, as I heard him teach that, I thought, I don't, I don't know what I, what would I do if, if I had to shelter in a cave with my family for six yeah. months, how would I? How would I handle that? And um, in that darkness, 
And then the fact that um, a temple was built ah, makes me cry again like I did on my walk. A temple was built near that cave. So the contrast of the, of the darkness and the forlorn feeling and the discouragement and then the light of the temple. I, I, I just, I, as I was there Saturday night, I, I came out different because I did something I think was really good for my ancestors and I could feel them with me. So isn't, I mean, life is quite amazing, isn't it? It's really hard, but it's really good. <laughs> Elaine and I, I, you know, we've, we've talked about these footnotes and life is hard and good and these miracles. I, I love this footnote and number, it's, it's footnote number nine. It's just an explanation of this, this person um, who was a serviceman. He says the translator, referring to the translator of the temple endowment. I, I just love this. The translator Tatsu Sato was baptized July 7th, 1946 by a U.S. serviceman C. Elliot Richards. And then it says Tatsu's wife, Chio Sato, so this is the translator, was baptized on the same day by Boyd K. Packer. Separately, Neil A. Maxwell fought in the Battle of Okinawa. And L. Tom Perry was among the first wave of Marines to go ashore in Japan following the peace treaty. And then it says Elder Packer, Maxwell, and Perry would become members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I mean, this, this tie-in and this real understanding of what was going on in Japan to me, I mean, it, you, I'll say this until I'm blue in the face, you cannot make this stuff up. You, people look for miracles and they are, they are right before us. I just, it, 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 it continues to just blow my mind how, how if you just, if we open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, God is making himself known. So have miracles ceased, I say unto ye nay. Uh, because if miracles cease, then faith ceases to exist. So, ah, uh, remember this talk. I think maybe it was just a tiny little talk in the scope of general conference and could get lost. But sisters, remember this talk. It's really, really profound. Yeah. May I throw out? You talked about how significant it is that this temple was be was built there and that in that sacred spot. I want to throw out one more, and this is, I did a lot, a lot of my research, especially for my PhD and master's degree, was in Mexico at the church school Benimerito de las Americas in Mexico City. And I remember when the church, leaders of the church announced that Benimerito was going to be closed and that the members of the church that, that were there were going to, all the students were going to have to find another school. To compare it to the United States, it genuinely would be like the church closing be. BYU. The school mm -hmm. had been there for, for, for 60 years. Students from all over Mexico, families from all over Mexico were saving money to send their children there. And it was the Mecca of the church as far as, as, far as education was concerned. And then one day they, they announced that they were going to announce it. I think many of the members of the church in Mexico were thinking that they were going to build, build something, even maybe build a university. But instead they closed the school and created and built the MTC. I remember the day that the MTC was open, there were a number of students that were outside the MTC and they had shirts on it and it just said, I gave up my seat for you. And it was so the missionaries would recognize the sacrifice that all of these Mexican saints had given to these young men and young women that were going on missions there. And it was the most, I mean, I was just sobbing. I gave up my seat for you in Spanish, right? Anyway, what was so profound, a couple of things. One is I interviewed President Nelson right after that happened. And he said, because of the faith and the obedience of these Mexican people, they are going to find that the Lord has so much more in store for them than, than that school. Not to minimize the school, but he just said, we're going to look forward and not backward. And then just to see in this conference, that a few conferences ago where President Nelson actually announced that there will be a temple built on the school property of Betty Medito de las Americas. So not only did these people receive an MTC, a missionary training center, but now a temple to be built. And I just think it's the same thing with this woman in, in, in Japan. She goes through all these hard times, but the Lord, and this is, a, I believe is a very strong principle of the gospel. The Lord will heal the brokenhearted and the Lord will make better. And that's what sacrifice is. We, we sacrifice and we make something holier than it, than it earlier was. And that's, that's this cave in Japan. That's the school in Benimerito. That's our families. You know, it's the president, it's the president Kimball where he says, 
whatever the Lord touches, he can heal, he can make live. And I think that's us. If we just look at our lives, if we put that patience, we may not be able to see it in the moment, but down the road, the Lord is going to heal and make, he's going to make temples and eternal families out of all of this seeming chaos and heartache. Oh, anyway. Barbara, amen. Just amen and amen. Remember this talk. It's yes. So profound. So profound. Should we go to the next one? Because you know, it's interesting. I think it's interesting where we're studying these two talks that, that maybe could have gotten lost in general conference, but, um, and I'm going to say his name is Elder Gerald Carrier, right? Is that kind of close? <laughs> For those of you who saw our little, our little walk that was introducing this talk, as you know, I called him Geraldo. I, I have no idea how to pronounce this name. I do not speak, speak French, but yours was really good. Elaine, so I'm going to give it to you. Yes, if that's what it is, that is what it is. Okay, but, thank you. But a thought just came to me before we go on to that. I uh, have been to Benny, Benny Medito uh, many times uh, in, in my calling, and it was very clear to me that the reason they had that church school was to prepare the future leaders of Mexico. I was in the room when the decision was made to close that school and make it an MTC. And I was on the Church uh, Board of Education at the time. Wow. And, and, and raised my hand to sustain that prophetic decision. And um, at the time, I have to just tell you in my heart, I thought, oh dear, what are they gonna, what are these precious people gonna do? But again, it, it, I, it, this is a really good, what you shared is really good for me to hear because what are they gonna do? To they're going to receive more and more and more and more blessings because they they followed a prophet, they've made sacrifices and look and a temple now. Elaine, I'm going to have to interview you later because I have written many articles and it never occurred to me that you were in that meeting when that happened in that room. That yes, 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 and yes. What every time I was in Mexico and Benny Merito, and I spent months and down there i've interviewed so many students and so many parents and so many families i have such a great love for those individuals there but to your point yes it is as if benny medito became in a sense was the kirtland ohio and now we've gone to nauvoo and now they are building salt lake i mean figuratively speaking you i have watched the church growth in mexico i mean we shortly after i mean we are talking stakes and mtcs and the numbers of temples that are being dedicated, announced and dedicated in Mexico, it is mind blowing to me. And so we just see this one decision. I thought, is this ever gonna get better for these people? Now it's like- It gets better. Wow. It gets better. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. wow. The Lord has made himself known to humble, powerful, obedient people. And he is blessing them with covenants, like nobody's business all over that country and throughout the world, frankly. it's That's really neat, Elaine, that you were there. I, it's, hum it's humbling to hear that. I shed many, many tears at that announcement they were closing that because I couldn't see the future. I just saw the moment, right? I, I was stuck in the moment of watching. And, and you know what? I, I know this is not the topic, but Elaine, the people would just go up to President, it, it was President Nelson and Elder Holland that were there at that moment. And they, you heard audible crying. I mean, yeah. it was audible crying yeah. in that room. And one person after the other just stood up and went to President Nelson and, and Elder Holland and hugged him and thanked him for ever having the opportunity to be there. And then Elder Holland got, got back up and he shared at that moment one of my all-time favorite quotes where he just said, tears are the price we pay for love. And then he just said, thank you so much for loving this school, for loving the Lord, and for loving each other. It was just this beautiful faith-promoting moment, but it was so hard but yet so spiritual and yes you i have seen the hand of the lord and i just love that connection to you too that and you see that in our lives sometimes in that moment it is hard but boy I, and, and you know we've seen some of these leaders i i actually was it was actually this so random to say this but i was where was i i was at a fire i spoke at a fireside on saturday night and I met this girl, she was just bright and beaming. She was, it was in South Jordan. And I just, I just said, tell me about yourself. And she told me her name and, and, and then she said, I'm from Mexico. And I said, what part? And she mentioned Sonora. And I said, I said, oh, I just love Mexico. I love the people there. I did some work at Benny Medito. And she said, my parents met at Benny Medito. And then I just, I, and I looked at her and I just thought, and that's what we're talking about. 
here's this beautiful woman who is teaching the gospel, shining as a bright light to the world, and her parents are a result of this sacrifice that they had made, and she, she hadn't attended there because the school had been closed before she had a chance to attend there. But now look at her. Yeah, she's doing great. She's blessing the world. She's anyway. I know we're going on and on on this topic, so we probably need to go on to this talk. But well, it, let's just let's just transition okay. now. I I kind of pulled us back, but but this talk he he says you know he gives scriptural examples of of. Uh, how we look on the outside so many times yeah. and, and the Lord looketh on the heart. And I think this talk really reinforces our identity, the principle of our identity. Uh, and so what would the, what would the doctrine be? You know what? I, I am going to go with, I guess we could say a few things here, but I think I would say the, the Godhead, and perhaps even I would say specifically being able to see as God sees and having the Holy Ghost um, teach us how to see other people and seeing people, as you've mentioned a few times, Elaine, seeing people as God sees them. For yes. me, I see that in three and five, I'll turn it back to you, but I, I love the doc, the, I guess the doctrine it would be the Godhead and then the principle is how God sees us may be a strong principle. So in three, he says, so he's talking about Samuel and Ananias and he says, they saw with their eyes and heard with their ears. And as a result, they passed judgment on others based on appearance and hearsay. And then he does the exact opposite, almost the paradox in number five. He says, in every case, the Lord saw these individuals for who they were and accordingly ministered to each one. And then he quotes Jacob. He says, he invited them all to come unto him, <clears throat> black and white, bond and free, male and female. And he remembered the heathen and all are alike unto God, the one being as precious in his sight as the other. And then number eight, he says, may we likewise not let our eyes, our ears, or our fears, which I love that he ties in fears, mislead us, but open our hearts and minds and minister freely to those around us as he did. It's beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. And, and don't we, don't we live in a society right now that, uh, that really, really labels everything. I think we, yeah. I think that Barbara, I'm going to share with them what you did uh, that, that really caused me to think I was, I was going to participate in a class at BYU that Barb teaches. And uh, one of the young women in the class texted me and said, we need your, we need your bio. We need your, the information so we can introduce you. And I, you know, I said, oh, well, I've already got that written. I'll send it to you. She said, no, this is different. We want you to describe yourself in terms of your discipleship. And I sat down and wrote a completely different bio because, you know, we we're always introduced in terms of, of what we've done, uh, what positions we've held. You know, I, she was a primary teacher and yada, yada. And, and, and for the, I, I, I've never written down the description of who I am in terms of my discipleship. And that, that was really a sweet, sweet thing to do. And um, I'd encourage everybody to do that. But Barb, thank you. You, you just prodded me along the, the covenant path by doing that. Well, honestly, it was, it was just reading President Nelson's talk on our true identity and, and to, the, to the young adults. And we just thought we, it would be nice if we all thought about ourselves that way children of god children of the covenant disciples of christ and then how do we really who are we really in terms of this covenant path e elaine i i'll throw this out to you in second nephi 26 which is where he's covering this is actually our reading for this week as well so i think that's in the book of mormon it's 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 always surprising to me how our reading and these talks go so well together but second nephi 26 verse 20 uh, verse 33 is the scripture he's quoting and since we've just read it, but I do love where he says, and he invited them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. This, this, you know, we've talked about this podcast that we're doing, and this is grounded, that grounded podcast. And, and I interviewed and we talked with sister. Um, of course, I just had this moment of brain freeze. Carol Costley. Sorry, we were talking to sister Carol Costley, who was on the Young Women's General Board. And I'll just tell you briefly, if you, if for any of you listening to this, please listen to the grounded from her perspective, because she tells this most powerful story 
of when she was, she found the missionaries in England and she was with all of her friends and she, she wanted to join the church, but her parents would not let her. And finally, at the age of 18, she is able to join the church. But the day before she joins the church, this is a 19, or mid 1970s, she finds out in that moment that the, that the black men and therefore her as a woman are not able to enter the temple and be sealed for eternity. And she's an 18 year old who believes the church is true. And all of a sudden the night before she's supposed to get baptized finds this out. And she tells the story of what happens with the missionary. And I'll just, I'll give you this much. And then you can read, you can, you can listen to her way of explaining. I mean, it is powerful. She just says in that moment, she said, this young missionary looked at me and said, Carol, I promise you that by the time you decide to get married in the temple, this ban will be lifted and you will be able to be sealed to your husband for eternity. I, I mean, she was 18 years old. It's a missionary there, probably 19, 20, 21, makes this promise to her. And she just said, the spirit confirmed it. She knew it was true. She knew the church was true. And she just joined purely on faith. I mean, you have to listen to the rest of the story because I just, I mean, I, I've heard her tell the story before, but when she's just telling it to me sitting across the table, I'm mean, like, you did what? You just joined on the, on the faith wow. that was presented to you by a 19 year old wow. young man and just your future family and eternity. I mean, I, to me, it's, <laughs> it's a level of faith. I hope, I hope that I have that kind of faith. But when we talk about all are alike unto God, and she says that truly, all are alike unto God. God made right what needed to be right for her family at the time she needed it. And he made everything work out. And her faith in God is just powerful, powerful, powerful. So, And, and faith is a incredible. principle of action, isn't yes. it, Barb? I mean, it's a principle of action. I, I remember being in Paris, France, talking to a, a little group of young women. I think they were probably about 18, 15 or 18 there. And I remember uh, vividly having an impression, which I, I sometimes I don't speak those out loud, but this time I did. And I said to the young women, I promise you uh, that if you will become worthy to have a temple recommend and to be in the temple, you will have one. It will come. And after that little meeting, my husband said to me, Elaine, you have no business doing that. You could, no, you, you should never do that. I said, Steve, it was a prompt. He said, I don't care. You're not the prophet. You cannot do that. And I realized that that I, 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 I said, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I was wrong in doing that. But the prompting was so strong. But what happened a few years later, a temple, a temple right across the street from Versailles. So I, I believe that uh, when you exercise faith, the Lord knows that, and He rewards your faith and your action. And and so that just reminded me of of that little group of young women and the, the beautiful, sweet feeling I had that night with them. If they would worthy be worthy, they'd get a temple, and they were. Well, and Elaine, I'll I'll speak to this a little bit as far as priesthood, power, and authority. You were speaking as a general young woman's president of the church, right? Is 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 that right? Yeah. And yeah. you have been given authority from the prophet, in this case, President Nelson, to speak and act in his name. I mean, that, that sounds, for some people, that sounds crazy. And there's some things that the, the prophet is supposed to be saying. But in that moment, as that leader, you were speaking to the women, the young women that you have stewardship over, and you are speaking in God's name in that moment to them. The, the Lord can fulfill it and the prophet can do whatever he needs to because he is the one with the priesthood keys to do it. But you were speaking with the authority that God had given to you through one who had priesthood keys in your behalf. I, I think that's a powerful story, Elaine, just to know how you know how I feel about it because you were. And I think that that's... Yeah, and, you know, and it wasn't, even though I had, I had that authority, not my place to receive revelation for the, for the church, but right. at that moment, right. at that right. moment... The Lord wanted those young women to prepare, yeah. and, and and I I I just love I, that. I love that. Amen, Elaine. And and again, that love and that feeling of love that you had for them, which is something that you've expressed and I see all the time with you. You love these women, these young women, so much, especially that I believe that the Lord is using you to continue to help them in their progression. I mean, what a what a powerful experience you just shared. I think I think he's using them to help me and mine actually but oh well huh? yes 
I love this story that he continues on with his wife, Isabel. I just love how he talks about how she has ears to hear and eyes to see and that he, she doesn't have the fear of people. I, I love the story that he, that she shares about really working and, and helping this other person, this, this woman that she was called to minister to. And number 10, he says, he's talking about this woman who needed her feet washed. And she says, for days, Isabel went to her home, washed her feet, changed her bandages. She never saw ugliness. She never smelled stench. She only ever saw a beautiful daughter of God in need of love and tender care. And then number 11, I just love this. He says, over the years, I, I and countless others have been blessed by Isabel's gift to see as the Lord sees. Whether you are the stake president or the ward breeder, whether you are the king of England or live in a shack, whether you speak her language or a different one, whether you keep all the commandments or struggle with some, she will serve you her very best meal on her very best plates. Economic status, skin color, cultural background, nationality, degree or righteousness, social standing or any other identifier label is of no consequence to her. She sees with her heart, she sees the child of God in everyone. And then he quotes President Nelson who he says, um, the adversary rejoices in labels because they divide us and restrict the way we think about ourselves and each other. How sad it is when we honor labels more than we honor each other. And then explains, labels can lead to judging and animosity. And then he's continuing to, to quote President Nelson. Any abuse or prejudice towards another because of nationality, race, sexual orientation, gender, educational degrees, culture, or, or other significant identifiers is offensive to our market, to our maker. And then, in this case, oh, I, I don't know what to call him exactly. I'll, I'm just gonna say Elder Kristoff in this case. He says, French is not who I am, yeah. it is where I was born. White is not who I am, it is the color of my skin, or lack thereof. Professor is not who I am, it is what I did to support my family. General Authority 70 is not who I am, it is where I serve in the kingdom of this time. First and foremost, as President Nelson reminds us, I am a child of God. So are you, so are all the people around us. I pray that we may come to a greater appreciation of this wonderful truth. It changes everything. What a just, what a beautiful testimony, Elaine. Just amazing. And back to having write my bio in that, in that way. And President Nelson says that we should think of ourselves in three ways. I am a child of God. I am a child of covenant and I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I can't help but think about the old young women theme. It's just in me and it's probably in all of you. Yeah. And I think that it was for specifically our, our generation and our time. But I, we are daughters of our heavenly father who love us. I always wondered why the pronoun was we and not I. Yeah. But, but I think was to help us I have those eyes. Yeah, to see people, everyone is a child of God, a daughter or a son of God, and then, and then of course the young women values it goes down faith, and then divine nature, individual worth, and I think those values, uh, as we say, we are daughters of Heavenly Father. Those values help us see the divine nature in us and in others, and that individual worth in us and in others. So, so we have that in us, every one of us that's probably listening to this podcast. That theme is in us. It and is in us. Is, we can look at people. We can have the spiritual gift, and it is a spiritual gift, to see people the way God sees them. I agree. Elaine, I, I'm going to tell you this little story that happened last night that you caused me to think of. I, had a, I have this dear friend that I have known since I was two years old. She was just the, the dearest of little buddies, you know? And she got married at 18 and, and moved away with her husband and her beautiful six children. And really, we haven't spent any time with each other since then. Until this last few months, she moved to Utah. She's, she's recently been through some, some marital struggles and things. And, and she's, we've, we've had a great opportunity to, to become dear, not just dear friends, because we've always been dear friends, but she's moved back. So we've been able to get to know each other as adults again. And last night, she was here at our hall with her children. and. And in the middle of the, <laughs> the middle of the dinner, my little Allie went downstairs and came running back upstairs and she said, Mom, the basement is wet. There's water all over the basement. And I just thought, what? <laughs> like what I still don't know exactly what happened. But Dustin and I ran down there, family ran down there. And my friend, it was it was just so beautifully late. I mean, she just starts throwing towels down the stairs and 
just bringing us back to our, you know, childhood memories of just being funny. And then the next thing I know, she runs back to her house grabs a bunch of fans, brings them back to our house. She's setting up chairs and tables and cleaning everything out. And Dustin and I are going, but I'm just watching her totally in awe. And then she has this brand new fan that she hasn't taken out of the box yet. She's just moved here recently. She's getting this fan. She's putting it all together. She's reading the instructions. And I just look at her and I just said, you know, you don't, it's okay. We, we can take care of this. It's going to be okay. We, you know, we can. And then in the middle of my sentence, she just looks up to me and she said, Barb, I want to be your friend. Not, not just a person, not just a fake, not just a, not just a, not just somebody that you met along the way. Please, please let me be your friend. And, and I just looked at it and I was like, it was, it was one of the Christ washing the feet moment. I mean, for me, it was that humbling. And I just said, you can build all the fans you want to build. <laughs> It really, I want you to be my friend too. And so she just sat there and she said, it'll just take me five minutes. Just let me get some screws in here. But please, Barb, let me be your friend. And it was, oh, Barb. Elaine, it was just the most simple but beautiful oh. moment. I just grabbed my little friend that I've known since I was two year old, but I have genuinely not spent any time with since we were 18 years old. And I just, just hugged her and held her we just held each other for this moment because it was such a real silly stupid water flooding moment when we just looked at each other like we don't care what our, our paths are we don't care where you've been and where i've been or anything else the reality is we are children of god and the lord has put us in each other's paths and we are friends and we are and friends. yeah please serve me please help me to it be was, what i need to become what you're telling us and sharing with us is so special gosh uh, we, are, we, we do need to have that desire to be each other's friends. And in this talk, he uses a, a phrase or a, a cup, two words that Elder Gong uh, also has used called covenant belonging. Yes. yes That's that in, uh, in, in uh, paragraph 20, covenant belonging. Um, and I, I love, I just love the way that sounds. I do too. Uh, and I, I've circled that because I thought I've got to study that more because really, when we do uh, make covenants, that has to be a piece of our covenant, uh, our covenant making and our, our covenant leadership, really. A Amen. <clears throat> Elaine, I, I think that covenant belonging, he talks about that quote from C.S. Lewis right before that, which to me is just so beautiful. I think this is kind of an example of what covenant leadership or covenant belonging is where he says, quoting C.S. Lewis, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest moment, uh, sorry, the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat but it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. And then he talks about these, these ideas and these abilities that they've been in different places to see people. But I agree that Elder Garrett Gong, where he talks about covenant belonging. And then he says, what a beautiful concept. We belong to a group of people who, will, who all try to place the Savior and their covenants at the center of their lives and to live the gospel joyfully. Elaine, this was, this was my little friend. I, sh I call her my little friend because I've known her since I was two. But this is, this is us. This is people who are genuinely, we love each other. We want to serve each other. It's a covenant belonging. We are united through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I feel the same way with you, Elaine. I've told you this a million times, and I'm sure this is many people that are listening. I just feel like the Lord has put me in your path to learn so much. It's, a, it's, it's this relationship where I just want to, learn from you it, it's clear that the lord puts each other puts us in each other's past but it's more than just learning it's it's becoming i i yeah. want to become a better person and therefore the lord has put me in a path where i can learn and soak in from you what i need to soak in and from hillary was her name yesterday these these just these these wonderful people that the lord has put in our path to help us to become and reach the potential we need to reach so thank well, you to Elaine as well. I want to be your friend. We are Let friends. me be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> we are friends. We are friends. I, I, I actually remember the exact moment, and I think Barb does too, when we were like, oh, oh, we're friends. 
we're supposed to we're supposed to be doing the things together and yes. that was quite a moment yeah. quite a moment i love how he ends this and maybe i'll just end with this uh it's almost the covenant belonging the primary song if you don't walk as most people do some people walk away from you but i won't i won't and then if you don't talk as most people do some people talk and laugh at you but i won't i won't i'll walk with you i'll talk with you and this is this walk with him that's how i'll show my love for you jesus walked away from none he gave his love to everyone so i will i will Elaine, that is who you are. I'll finish off with 23, at the okay. very end, right in the middle. He says, I testify that the way we treat each other is a direct reflection of our understanding of and appreciation for the ultimate sacrifice and atonement of his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that like him, we may love each other. We may, we may love others because this, that is the right thing to do, not because they are doing the right thing or fitting the right mold. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, I, I testify of that as well. So Elaine, thank you for, as I as I've walked with you and you know this, as we walk together, I love watching you love people. I love watching you see the beauty in people regardless of who they are. And I love your concern and care for people. So I, I will simply testify as a friend of Elaine Dalton, that she is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I appreciate being able to walk by her side as she is walking by the side of the Savior. And I say oh, that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love you. I love you. We're all in this together. And Barb, it's such a privilege for me Amen. to get to know from you. You're just a young little kid, but you're sure <laughs> wise. <laughs> Hilarious. And, and I, think, I think why we do these things, why Barb and I are just putting ourselves out there is just because we love the Lord. And we know who you are. We know who we are. And we know what a prophet of God has asked us to do. And we just want to contribute any way we can. But in the, in the end, I think the greatest power, as we talk about priesthood power and everything else, I think the greatest power that we have is love. I do. I think love is our power. And I just, I just testify that the Lord's in every detail of our lives. And I do that in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, everyone. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday. Bye-bye. Bye, friends. Bye, Elaine. Bye-bye.